ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. Stay tuned for another original Studio B production right here on The Voice 17104.com. Many of you know that everything that has ever happened to you is now. Reverend Barb Ellerby is a disruptor. One of her assignments from God is to meet you where you are and then disrupt you by teaching you to replace who man says you are to who Abba Father sees you as and calls you to be. In these broadcasts, Reverend Barb will provide his word as a means of breaking old thought patterns and embracing his truth that you are fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. And that's not all he says about you. It's time for you to walk in your Ephesians 2.10 self as his unique masterpiece, recognizing he has called you and created you and I for such a time as this. Now sit back and enjoy tonight's broadcast. Good morning, family. I'm Reverend Barbara Ellerby. This is El Rohi's Child Ministry, and I welcome you to today's program. Please bow your head. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to come and examine your word. Father, we ask, Lord, that seeds would be planted in the heart, mind, and spirit of each and all of us. Father, that you would touch us, that you would meet us at our point of need. Father, we are all in need of healing in one way or another, whether physical, emotionally, spiritually, socially, sexually, whatever it is, Lord, we are in need of a healing. So we ask, Father, that you would touch each of us, meet, meet us at our point of need, heal our heart and our mind and our body and our spirit. Draw us closer to you. Help us to develop a fresh hunger and thirst for you and your word like never before. We thank you for this season of Lent, this season of self-examination, a season of surrender, confession, and repentance, a season of reevaluation. We ask, Lord, that you would open up our eyes and our ears and our heart and our mind and our spirit that we would hear clearly from you, but that we would also clearly see ourselves as we are so that we would know, we would hear from you what needs to be surrendered, what needs to be changed. Thank you as always for your mercy for you could have removed us from this earth at any time, all of us or even us individually but you've given us another day, Lord. So help us, Lord, to move towards you, to seek you and to work for you. We need our hearts changed. We need our spirit and our mind transformed. So we're asking, Lord, that you would do these things in us. Help us, Lord, to love you, to truly, truly love you. For if we love you, if we love you with all of our heart, our mind and our spirit and our will, we won't be as inclined to sin. Help us, Lord, to love ourselves. Help us to recognize we are who you created us to be. We are your unique masterpiece. And as life goes on, you will change us. So help us stay surrendered so that we can change as you direct us to change. Then help us to love our neighbors as ourselves. And only as loving ourselves can we truly love others. And only us loving you can we truly love others. In loving you and loving ourselves and loving others, we again will be less inclined to harm others. So Father, we're asking Lord that you would change us and move on our heart, mind and spirit even now. Father, we thank you Lord again for this season. And we ask that we will continue on daily reflecting confessing and repenting the things that we do that are not pleasing to you so that we can work for you we can live for you we can move according to how you would have us move we thank you for your patience and we thank you for your forgiveness and help us be reminded that in part that is what this season is about preparing us for jesus crucifixion his sacrifice, your sacrifice, and then the ultimate of his being raised from the grave. 
We thank you for your plan, even when we don't understand it. We thank you for your plan and we thank you for your love. We ask these things, Lord, in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we say amen and amen. All right, family, I was to do the lesson that I'm doing today. I was to have done Tuesday, but I was under the weather. And just because I had a little bit of lassie bark going on, you, you didn't want to hear from me Tuesday. So today we're going to pick up on part two. Um, as you'll recall, last Sunday, um, I did a message on Jesus being the way. And that message is based on John 14. I'm going to read the first through the seventh verses to you now. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know, excuse me. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. That again is John 14, verses 1 through 7. Now, as a reminder, this is a conversation that is taking place after John 13, and John 13 is the chapter um, in which Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Okay, he has spent the Passover with them. This is a continuation of that evening. He's not been arrested yet. But he has this conversation with them and he's letting them know that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And only through him can we find salvation only through him can we spend eternity with him if you'll recall <clears throat> when i spoke on this subject the way last week um i started off and i think i uh, also towards the end spoke about my frustration several years ago because of um oprah and others trying to comfort people and make them feel good about um, their religions and not um, choosing to have a relationship with Christ. They, she and many others were telling people that there has to be another way. God wouldn't only have the only way is Jesus. There has to be another way. And at that time, when I spoke about it last week, and literally during that period of time, um, I was losing my, my mind on the subject and was just praying because it, this is a woman who has so much influence, who has told people she's read the Bible countless times. And if you go to church for any length of time, you're going to hear at least, if not a scripture reading, if not a litany reading, if not a sermon or a song that is going to tell you that Jesus is the only way that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So that began a time of frustration for me at the time of study in that area, because my concern is those who are influenced. Because again, by nature, we don't necessarily mean to be lazy, but if someone will give us the information and save us from reading this intimidating book, we'll take it where we can get it. And after all, Oprah and some of the others are good people and they would never lead us astray. Well, my statement then, my statement now, if she has not changed her mind on that, if she has not accepted that Jesus Christ is the only way, she'll be accountable to God for walking under that belief, knowing that she has read, allegedly read his word, okay? She'll also be accountable for those who she led away that 
that she influenced them into believing that there was another way other than Christ for those who might fall away from God because of what is being fed and sowed into their spirit and their soul and their mind and their heart. But it doesn't just stop there because truthfully we have a responsibility to pursue this relationship with God ourselves, And unfortunately, we're not always told that. We're not told that we serve a God of intimacy who wants that intimate relationship with us he wants us to know him as well as he knows us, okay? Now, forever in a day, you hear me speak on Psalm 139. And I do because to me, it's, it is so profound in the way that it, it lays out this relationship with God for us. It, it, to me, the, there's so many parts of it, but one of the parts tells us there's no place we can hide from him. But I want to start with that first verse of Psalm 139. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue. But behold, oh, Lord, you know it all together. You've hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Um, I'm going to skip down to the 13th verse you for you form my inward parts you covered me in my mother's womb I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest part of the earth your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your book they all were written the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts of me, O oh God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. That's just a portion of Psalm 139. And for me, it is just so profound in this relational God that we have that wants us to know how important each of us are to him individually. So if we are that important to him individually and he has made it <clears throat> easier than anything in the world almost to accept him as our savior, to make himself available to us, it begins to be on us that we don't seek to get to know him better because he's telling us there's not a thing about you I don't know. We are in a, a time where you have two schools of thought going on, well, many schools, but two that I wanna speak on briefly. One, I'm saved, I've done all I need to do, I don't have to do any further, okay? Now, that would be arrogance on our part, except for in many cases, we're not taught in churches that he wants that intimate relationship with us. We are allowed to believe all I have to do is get saved. I'm done. I go to church, you know, occasionally and I'm going to heaven. That's all I need to worry about. That's one of the schools of thought. The other school of thought is that um, we're in the last days. So people are focused on looking at the signs, looking at the wars looking at how to predict how much time we have left. Both of these mindsets are distractions to keep us from seeking that in-depth relationship with God that he wants with us. It's, it's interesting because there's a meticulousness about him and how 
he does everything he does regarding us. Those that are curious by nature will be curious enough to try to figure out who is this God that designed every part of me, knows every part of me. So they may be more inclined to seek him to find out who he is in that, in that mindset. And then there'll be those who are blessed to be at a church that teaches that he wants an intimate relationship with you. But so many others are just kind of left flailing around, uh, almost using God as an ATM machine. And he wants us to know, and he's very clear in the scripture when he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. So as I said last week, I, I spent the whole time talking about him being the way. And I just want to refresh briefly in that, again, saying he is the only way to God. There is no other way to God. There is no other way to salvation except as, excuse me, as, except accepting him, at, accepting Jesus as our savior, okay? And multiple things happen at that time when you accept him as your savior, you receive him in your heart. You also receive a Holy Spirit who's going to be your, your guide, your helper, your comforter, okay? Scripture has already told us that God has said he will never leave us or forsake us. So in that accepting Christ as our savior, we now have all three of them with us, knowing us better than we know ourselves, okay? That right there is an indication of a relational savior, a relational God and a relational Holy Spirit. The scripture also tells us that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So they're, they're all in us, okay? And the scripture that I read again is telling us there's not a thought we think that they're not aware of. There's not an action we take that they're not aware of. There's not a word we're getting ready to speak that they're not aware of. They are so in tune to us. Nothing about us surprises them. Now we still have the ability to surprise ourselves and we have the ability to surprise those around us, but we can't surprise God. It's not even possible. He knows us that well. And he knows us that well in part because he wants us to turn to him as the way so that we can spend eternity with him. He doesn't want us to reject him. So this falls into this series because we're looking at this journey, this last day's journey that Jesus is doing as he moves closer and closer to the cross on our behalf. But he's doing stuff along the way. Now there's the healings, the miracle signs, wonders, the deliverance that's going on. But he's doing stuff that is sending Sadducees, the Pharisees over the edge. They've already, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, they were like, okay, he got to go. He got to go now. It, it's on. Put the plan together. You know, find who you need to participate at whatever level. He got to go. And Jesus further agitates them, the Sadducees and Pharisees, when he tells them, the first and great command is to love the Lord with all your heart, your mind, and your will, okay? You love God that way. And then love your neighbor as yourself. They're irritated with him in that conversation. So everything he does, they're holding against him. But he knows he's at a point where he's got to make things so crystal clear to his disciples because they're going to go on and do greater things than he did. And people think that means that they, they were, every one of them was going to just go out, run and touch people and heal, heal people right and left. That, that was part of their job to do the healings that um, God would have them do. But their biggest, biggest job was to go and make disciples. Their biggest job was to go out and share the word. 
And in sharing the word, they were sharing Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. But he can't let them go until they understand that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So he's spending time reinforcing with them who he is. Now, arrogantly, we say, how did they walk with him for three years and see him do miracle signs and wonders? How did they walk with him all that time and not realize who he was to the degree that they should have? How do they not know that he was the way, the truth, and the life? Why is Thomas questioning again? Poor Thomas gets in trouble. He is like, Peter is the mouth. But Thomas is the one asking questions and making statements that just get him in trouble in society. He's doubting Thomas. He's now saying, Lord, we do not know where you are going and how can we know the way? And Jesus says, tell him, I am the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I just said that. So again, in, in arrogance, we look back and we're like, how could they not know that? Because they've walked with him daily for three years. Well, think about it. In your life, the people that you know, that you swear you know everything about, there are times when they surprise you. There's, there's times when you misunderstand who a person is, or you may not clearly see who a person is. And that's in part what was going on with the disciples. They, they had a, a, a carnal mindset. Their belief was, he had told them he was the soon coming king. Okay, he tells them he is going to have his kingdom. Okay, they're anticipating him taking over one of these palaces. Now, they have not seen him do a bit of violence at all, but they're anticipating him taking over one of these palaces and they're going to rise with him when he does this. They're no longer going to be walking around as the, as the, poor vagabonds, they're gonna to move to the big, big palace, the big castle with Jesus because they don't understand that it's not in the physical and it's not in the natural, it's in the spirit. So he spends time explaining um, these things to them so that they get more clarity and even in that they still don't clearly understand. He is in this season also told them um, three different times that son of man will be killed and that his disciples will scatter. So I'm gonna skip forward for a minute. When Jesus is arrested at Gethsemane, they scatter. Okay, they scatter for real. They they run, and really the only one that hangs with them till he dies on the cross is John. But the rest of them all scatter. But he's had the opportunity to plant the seeds. So once he's resurrected, he gets a chance to further grow those seeds. But let's look at what the rest of this phrase means. We've looked at the way. Okay, we, we hopefully have an understanding that the only way to heaven is through this relationship with Jesus, receiving your salvation and beginning to walk with him, God, and the Holy Spirit. So what is this truth? What is this truth that you keep hearing me say? Well, I'm going to give you some definitions. Let's start with the word true. True is being in accordance with fact or reality accurate or exact. That's what true means. Truth is the quality of being true. It's accepted fact or belief. Biblical truth, that which is consistent with the mind, the will, the character, the glory, and the being of God. Jesus is the truth, okay? He is the truth now. Jesus is also the written word of God, okay? So Jesus is the way and he's the truth. All things that are measured for truth are measured against him. Is it in 
keeping with his character because you're either walking in truth with Jesus, okay? Or you are, as someone else said, dancing with the devil. When you look at John 10, 10, it says the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I, meaning Jesus, have come that they may have life and that they may have it abundantly. He is the way, the truth, and the life, okay? He is the one that can help us walk this walk. And again, will we be perfect? No, we won't be perfect, but we should be striving to be righteous. We should be striving to walk with Jesus, walk in a way that is pleasing to him. So this series has been entitled The Season of Remember. Jesus is the only way, again, was last week. But this season of remember, remembering what he went through for us. The, um, the scriptures that I've been referring to in um, Isaiah 53, as well as in Acts, the second chapter, the third chapter and the fourth chapter remind us that all of this is part of a plan <clears throat> that was created before we were even placed on this earth. God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit came up with this plan of how we could get God's forgiveness, how we would be able to be heard by God, because we are all just so sin-filled that God would turn his back on us except for Jesus, except for Jesus hanging on that cross. And him hanging on that cross, that's how he becomes the way for us. Because prior to that, people were still dealing with that day of atonement, sacrificing animals so that they could get God's forgiveness. When Jesus hung on that cross, <clears throat> he bore the sins and the wickedness of all of us. And in doing that, God turned his back from Jesus. He just turned his back towards Jesus. He turned away from Jesus because Jesus was so covered with sin. The action that Jesus took hanging on that cross allowed God to forgive us, for us to be reconciled with God, that nothing could come between us. So as we look back and further back at the same time, looking back at the crucifixion, but looking further back at this conversation he's having with them, we have the foresight or the, the hindsight, excuse me, to see what he meant truly when he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. We understand that better because we have the, the benefit of, of looking back at the Bible to see what occurred. The disciples were walking, basically walking blind, hopefully trusting him to gain the understanding that they needed to. But in this, he is the truth. He is the true word of God. He is the living, walking, breathing word of God, okay? That makes him the truth. And that is, again, how we measure everything else. Is this pleasing to God or is it not? Does this honor God or does it not? As we walk through this life, it behooves us to examine our heart and our actions and, and think about this next thing you're gonna do, this next thing are you, that you're gonna say. Do these things truly honor God? And if not, is this something I need to do? We are to live a, a life of quality and that's not meaning everybody's supposed to have the best car, that's materialism. 
we're looking at what our spiritual walk looks like. We are to walk a, a life of honesty with God. Recognizing that he's going to be truthful for us and to us if we talk to him, but he's waiting for us to be truthful to him. Do we give the fake lip service or, really, or are we really trying to change and walk as he would have us walk? Are we willing to cheat and take shortcuts or are we going to try to walk in a way that honors him? Jesus has told us who his father is, which is God. When we became saved and you move into that Ephesians, the first chapter, it tells us we're called, we're chosen, and we're adopted. We're joined heirs with Jesus, okay? They're trying to make it as, as easy for us to feel loved and accepted, all right? In walking this walk, the, the battles that we come against, the trials and the tribulations that we go through, if we go through on our own, we're gonna have a lot of frustration and failure, a lot of sadness and sorrow, or we can walk with the truth with us. So what do I mean walk with the truth with us? Well, I wanna take you back to another scripture that I've shared recently in Matthew, the fourth chapter, as well as Luke, the fourth chapter, we see in the beginning when Jesus is tempted by the devil, he's in the wilderness, okay? But I wanna share this with you as a reminder to bring this together. Fourth chapter of Luke reads with a subtitle, Satan tempts Jesus in the wilderness. Then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterwards, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written, <clears throat> man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all this will be yours. Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you and in their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. All right, so within the body of that, Jesus speaks truth to the enemy. And the truth that he speaks is the word of God, okay? Now I said a couple minutes ago, that Jesus is the living word of God. So you had the truth, which is Jesus, speaking the truth to the enemy. And the enemy had to flee. The enemy had to go. He had to recognize he could not tempt Jesus. He could not defeat Jesus. The thing is, he knew it before he did it, but he tried it anyway. And for me, that's a reminder that if he's going to try Jesus and knowing Jesus is at, he knows God has called me. God has chosen me. God has adopted me, not because I'm anybody special, because he's done the same for you. But if he tempted Jesus, he's going to try to tempt Jesus. If he 
tries to destroy Jesus, he's going to try to destroy me. So what do I have to use to keep the enemy from destroying me? I have the truth. And the truth is Jesus. And the truth is the word of God. So that's why it becomes imperative for us to get God's word, aka Jesus, in our heart, in our mind, and in our spirit, so that when the temptations come or when the actions come against us or when there's a crisis, we can call on the word of God and we can speak the word of God, we can speak the truth back to the enemy because that's what Jesus did. And he is our continuous role model. If, if when Satan came to him, stood before him, tried to tempt him, if all Jesus did was say, it is written and gave a scripture and Jesus, Jesus, that's all Jesus is doing each of the three temptations, okay? He'll, the enemy will say something and Jesus will say, it is written. Three times they go through this. And on the third time, the enemy's like, you know what? Okay, I see I'm not getting anywhere with you. I'm out of here. If it works for Jesus, why can't it work for us? Well, the reason it can't work for us is because we don't know the truth. And it is, isn't it interesting that the more we know the word of God, the more we know Jesus, the more we know the truth. Other than that, if we don't put the time in getting to know the word, getting to know the truth, getting to know Jesus, then we become bait for the enemy to just run us ragged, run us crazy, run, run us wrong. We make decisions every day. And a scripture that says, choose this day who you will serve. And if we really sat down and looked at the choices we made, the choices that were open to us, we don't choose God every day. Even though we may have a little placemat, a doormat that says, choose this day who you will serve. Or we may have a little bracelet that says, choose this day who you will serve. We don't choose to serve God every day because we don't move closer to God every day. So we fool ourselves. And the enemy's happy that we have the little, the little doormat out and we walk around saying to people, choose this day or we'll put on Facebook, I choose God this day. The enemy's happy if, if, if that's all our walk is like. That's our truth right there. That's all our walk is like is to be able to say, I choose Jesus. But he's watching to see of our actions are speaking louder than the words that are coming out of our mouths and our actions do speak louder than our words. So what are we doing to walk in the word that Jesus spoke? Because these are red, 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 red letters in the Bible mean Jesus said, it. I am the way, the truth and the life. What are we doing to know him as the way, the truth and the life? What are we doing? Are we studying his word and getting it planted in our heart and our mind and our spirit so when the enemy attacks, we can speak back God, work God's word to him? And it's good. Many of us have different scriptures that, that we're able to use. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am more than a conqueror. I am the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. God, I know the plans. God knows the plans he has for me. OK, we, we know some scriptures and that's good. I'm not down anybody who doesn't have a large arsenal of scripture. Because if all you know the word, if all you know is the words and you don't know Jesus. If you if you look upon this as an assignment to read a novel known as the Bible, if we look at this as an assignment to get some little cliches or some little phrases we can use so that when people quiz us on Bible trivia, we can say we knew this word. If that's all we're doing, we're not walking in the truth. We're not walking in the blessing that's available. 
God has shown us in multiple ways how important we are to him. The sacrifice of Jesus is just part of it. The, the fact that Jesus agreed and God sent him to this earth to walk for 30 years, for the years that he was here, okay? We rob ourselves of a relationship of one who loves us like no one else does. And so many of us have brokenness and, and we feel lost and we feel alone and we feel abandoned and betrayed and we feel rejected. And we sit in that spot and we begin to wallow in it and think that's where we're supposed to be. There's a, a statement that I use periodically and it's a little kid's verse that you heard as a child, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, I think I'll eat worms, okay? Many of us walk in that. We walk in that place of sadness and darkness, not moving on our own behalf into the life or the light or the way or the truth that are available. You, there's no reason for us not to improve and draw near to God in this relationship other than we're, we're lazy or we don't understand that we have responsibility in this relationship. And it's sad because there's not a relationship that we have that we don't make some kind of investment in. We, we make investment of time in the relationship with our job. We make investment of, of talents and gifts in our, rela in our relationships on our jobs. In social relationships, just people that you hang out with, you make an investment of time. And you make an investment of study, getting to know them, to know the activities you want to do that do with them. There are there, there are certain friends I have that I'll do certain things with. Okay. If we are friends and I go to the movies with you and you hit me during the movie and want to talk to me, we will never go to the show again. Because leave me alone. I need to, I need to, I'm processing to see how this plays out. And can I figure it out before it ends? And I don't need you hitting me because that's not what I do, okay? So I've invested time in you to see who you are, to, to see if you are a friend, a movie friend or not. It just might be that we're supposed to go shopping together or we go to church events together, but we will never go to the show again after you hit me that one time. Don't hit me more than once in the movie because I, I can't be responsible. But I'm saying that we invest time in getting to know people. And many times we invest more time in negative stuff than we do with God. Now he's telling us, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. The more time we invest in him, the more clearly we can see other things. Because as we spend time with him, we gain wisdom. In gaining wisdom, we're better, excuse me, better able to make better life decisions. He didn't say to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and just be done with it. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes through the Father except through me. So he's telling us, I am the middleman. Now, if you want to get to my Father, you got to go through me. So how do we go through him? We get to know him. And getting to know him, we get to know the Father. And getting to know the Father, we get to know him. They are all a package to deal along with the Holy Spirit. And they are the truth. So our choices in life are to walk in truth or walk in the enemy, walk with the enemy. We believe we're straddling the fence. We believe that 
one day when you have more time, we'll spend more time with God. But the truth of that matter is tomorrow's not promised. There are people who leave out of their house with an expectation of returning back home and they never make it back home. There are people who go to sleep at night with an expectation and a to-do list of what they're going to do tomorrow. And that's all well and good, but that to-do list survives them because they don't wake up in the morning. So the, the, the urgency in, in getting this relationship with God is nothing to play with. We don't have tomorrow. It's not promised. There was a, a song that the Winans did, it's probably 30, at least 30 years ago, called Tomorrow. And within the, the body of that song, they said, who promised you tomorrow? We're not promised tomorrow. So our, our job is to draw as close to God as we can, to get to know him as best we can, to be a surrender to him as we can. For he's the truth, he's the life, he's the way. He is the only way we will see eternity. And isn't it better to get to know him here than to walk into eternity and not know where you're going. Now, we don't know what eternity looks like. We, we don't generally get to go and come back. The best way to prepare is to get to know him, to, to get rid of that old baggage here that could hamper your relationship further on. Get rid of the things the relationships, the habits, the attitudes that are holding us back. If we're walking in the truth, okay? If we're walking in the truth, we're walking in trying to love people. And that ain't easy because easy a lot of us are not easy to love, okay? But if we're walking in the truth, we're asking God, Guide my mouth, guard my tongue, fill me with your spirit. Help me through this situation. Help me with this relationship. Help me with this job. Because truly, he is our truth. He is our way. He is the way that we can get through whatever it is we're going through. But we make the mistake of, of trying to be long rangers at the wrong time. We've <clears throat> not sought his face. We've not sought the truth. The more we spend time in this word, the better we learn who God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are. The more time we spend planting, because I don't want to say burying his word in us, but planting his word in us, when the attacks come, he can speak truth to power. We can speak truth to the crisis. But we have to start somewhere. And the, the where to start is in his word. You know, we, we like to do the um, popcorn prayers or the ATM prayers. Lord, I need a miracle. Lord, I need this. Lord, I want this. We need to spend time reading his word. And we need to spend the ongoing conversations with him, getting to know him, sharing us with him. Now, again, there's not a thing about us he doesn't know. He knows us better than we know ourselves, but he waits for us to share us with him because he wants to share him with us. I mean, he got a whole book about him so that we could get to know him. We are talking about the one who sticks closer than anybody. The only one who had the ability to hang on that cross for our sins. The... 
eternal life that we seek with Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit can only be found through the relationship with him. So how do we get to know them better? Well, again, we read the word, study the word, and we meditate on the word. To meditate on the word is there's maybe a scripture that speaks to you. And you just want to process or chew on that for a couple of days, maybe a week. Examine it, roll it over in your mind, think about how it applies. Maybe do a little bit of little research to, to get a clear understanding of what the scripture means. But we're spending time focusing on getting closer to him. There's movies all the time of uh, somebody who will, like a man who'll see a woman or a woman who'll see a man and they, they believe they're attracted and they, they watch that person to see what that person likes and they begin to adjust themselves to meet the model that that person, they think that person wants. And many times it includes pretending to have similar interests. Many times it includes developing for real similar interests. Again, it's the investment of time. And that's what God waits for from us. He wants us to invest some of our time, the time that is so precious. He wants us to invest that in him. He wants us to get to know him as well as he knows us. And it doesn't require 24 hours a day, you sitting there in the Bible. That's not what we're talking about. This is truly learning who he is, spending some time reading and studying, meditating, but also prayer and praise and worship, giving, fasting. These are all things that will bring us closer to God, that will help us develop that intimate relationship. The thing is that we we fall into society's mindset. So it becomes easy for us to be bored. I, I was reading the Bible and I fell asleep. Okay, well, that's not going to send you to hell that you fell asleep. Don't give up. Keep trying to read. Additionally, some people, reading doesn't hold their attention. So you can listen to the Bible. There was a, it was funny because there was a, an article I was reading this morning and it talked about, there's a, a Bible, a, a newer Bible webpage that has, I think it said 200 uh, different, um, 200 different books regarding the Bible, okay? So for those who might read it and be intimidated and don't understand and don't know who to ask, there's commentaries, a physical commentary you can get at a Bible bookstore or online. And there's also the online ones that will break down what the word is saying so that you'll understand it. God never set out to make his word um, a word that is not understood. That was never his intent. But we fall into the trap with the, the laziness, the boredness, his words not exciting, so I can't read it. There's all those long names in it, so I, I can't read the long names, so I just shouldn't read. There's so many things that are set in place to be a discouragement. that we have to break past. Again, he's telling us, I am the way, Jesus is saying, I am the way to God. I am the truth of God. I am the life, the life of eternity that you want. You wanna spend with Jesus, God and the Holy Spirit. So you either accept them and get to know them or you reject them. The Sadducees and the Pharisees, 
rejected who Jesus was. They refused to believe who he was. And as religious as they were, as well-versed as they were, as calling themselves as walking with God as they did, they rejected the way, the truth, and the life. Now, we can't sit back and see who repented, who realized what they did and confessed and repented. We, we don't know. We don't know where anybody is going to spend eternity. When we get with Jesus, again, there's the, the ongoing joke where the person gets to heaven and St. Peter's talking to them and he's showing them on the tour and says, wow, I'm surprised. And St. Peter's like, why? So I'm surprised that the people that made it in. And he's like, yeah, you should see the people that are surprised that you made it in. We don't know who will make it to heaven. But our job is to get ourselves right with God. Do the confessing and the repenting. For he's faithful to forgive us. Walk closer with him. Get to know him better so that you're choosing him and in choosing him, you're working for him. And I don't mean as a preacher because that's not everybody's call to stand in a pulpit, but it's everybody's call to minister, to show kindness, to show the love of God, to, to be that example, to draw men to God. But each of us have our responsibilities and each of us have the purpose that he gave us before he even created us. The enemy's job is to distract us. I just read John 10, 10, he comes to steal, kill and destroy. If he can prevent us from relationship with God, he's ecstatic. If he can distract us so that we don't strengthen our relationship with God, He's, the enemy is ecstatic. Let nothing come between you and God. I mean, Jesus has said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Keep seeking God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Put some time up, 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 up every day to spend some time with them through, again, through prayer, through praise and worship through studying the Bible, reading the Bible, meditating on the word, fasting and giving. These are the ways that draw us closer to God, but do something every day to draw you closer to them. Stop letting the enemy take up all your time. There's a mindset right now that's really big. You hear it everywhere, self-care. The best self-care we can do is accepting Jesus as our savior, spending time with God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Because again, we're spending time with truth. We're, we're spending time and we're growing. And in that growth, what will happen is we'll change our ways. We need to change all of us. There's some mess in all of us that needs to be surrendered to God. I, I see what some other people's mess is, but more than anything, I, I see my mess. And when I don't, when I miss it, he is faithful even then to show me um, this right here. I'm gonna need you to change that. So am I walking perfect? No, but I'm trying to walk in a way that I don't miss hearing from God, especially about the things that I need to change. The easiest thing for me is to do these messages. The harder thing for me to do if I don't spend time with him is to hear from him. So it behooves me, it is, is important to me to spend one-on-one -on -one time with him, to talk to him, to get understanding. I had a, a an amazing blessing yesterday um someone sent me a note and in the note was the psalm that stalks me psalm 119 stalks me 
And so I'm looking at this, this number they sent me. And I'm like, why did you send me this number? And they explained why. And I'm like, oh, because Psalm 119 haunts me. And they're like, and I said, it stalks me. And they're like, oh, no, no, it didn't have anything to do with that. And I'm like, okay, well, I read the verse and it just totally hit me with right where I am. And I'm not going to share the verse with you because it was between me and him. But the more aware I become of his word, I see the other signals that I need to see. I see the things that I need to do and I'm able to draw closer to him. And if he would waste his time and do that with me, okay? He'll do the same thing with you. And I don't mean the waste time part, but if he would invest his time in me, let me say it that way, he'll invest it with you. So the thing that you need to do is, is make that for real decision Choose this day who you will serve. And then what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about knowing him? Because he's told you he's the way, he's the truth and the life. No one can come to the father except by him. So what are you doing to get closer to him? There's not an excuse Bible-wise anymore because some of the prettiest Bibles I found. I have a friend that really actually turned me on to that was my dear friend, Eartha. Some of the prettiest Bibles I found have been in Goodwill where they're only two, three bucks. You also have online Bible apps and you don't even have to go to an app. You can go on the internet and say biblegateway.com and it will give you at least 20 different translations of the Bible, depending on what your need or your interest is. From the King James, they got Spanish, they've got German, they got all kinds of different Bibles, okay? If your relationship with God is not being strengthened, it is your fault, it is your choice, okay? And after today, you know he's the way, the truth, and the life, and he is waiting for you to draw near to him. So with that being said, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for him taking the time to tell us he's the way, the truth, and the life. And the only way to you is through him. Help us to continue to examine our heart, mind, our spirit, our actions, our attitude, our moods. Help us to surrender to you, Lord. Help us to surrender our fears and our worries and our concerns. Help us to surrender to you all parts of ourselves, especially those parts that make us feel that we're not good enough. For you've told us in your word that you called us, that you chose us, that you adopted us, that we are joint heirs to the kingdom. So help us to stop believing the word and the word of the enemy. Help us to remember that Jesus said, I came to bring life and bring it more abundantly. And that that's not the material, it's a spiritual abundance that's available to us. Give us a hunger and thirst for you and your word like never before. Change our hearts. Help us to surrender to you, Lord, those things that are not honoring you. Father, we just ask these things, Lord, in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we say amen and amen. All right, family, I will be back on this Tuesday because it's fifth Tuesday. So see you then. God bless. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you again for joining us for the Elroy's Child Broadcast. Here on the voice17104.com with your host, Reverend Barb Ellerby. Make sure you join us and mark your calendar every second and fourth Tuesday, 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. for more of the Elroy's Child Broadcast 
Remember today you are fearfully and wonderfully made in God's image. And that's not all he says about us. It's time for us to walk in our Ephesians 2.10 self as God's unique masterpiece, recognizing he has created us for such a time as this. Go with God. We'll see you next week on the broadcast. This is gospel recording artist Jay Nicole Jones, and you're listening to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania's Community Radio. The Voice 17, 104.